बच्चों आज हम लिवर सरोसिस के बारे में पढ़ेंगे टुडे टॉपिक ऑफ डिस्कशन इज लिवर सरोसिस सो दीज आर द नॉर्मल हेपेटोसाइट्स और नॉर्मल टिश्यूज ऑफ द बॉडी एंड देयर आर फाइबर्स इन बिटवीन देयर आर फाइब्रोटिक बैंड्स दे बिकॉज़ ऑफ इन्फ्लेमेशन दे आर थिकेंड विद सम ऑफ द प्रोटीनेशियस डिपोजिशन यानी कि इन ये नॉर्मल हर सेल के दरमियान में फाइबर बैंड्स होते हैं ऑफ कोर्स टू सपोर्ट देम लेकिन इन सर्टेन कंडीशंस इनकी जो थिकनेस होती है वो प्रोटीन डिपोजिशन की वजह से इन्फ्लामेशन में ये इंक्रीज हो जाती है लाइक व्हेन देयर इज अल्कोहल व्हिच एक्ट टू लिवर और वायरसेस व्हिच अटैक टू द लिवर और देर में भी एनी अदर डैमेज टू द लिवर the liver start inflaming inflammation and sometimes its size increases and there are increased fibrinaceous bands or proteins which which concentration increase among the liver cells and slowly and gradually they increase 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 to such an extent that there is chronic scarring and damage which is not reversible and this is called liver cirrhosis so the definition of cirrhosis if someone asked you in the examination then it is this is a long term irreversible process of degeneration and regeneration resulting in fibrosis of the liver so the process of regeneration and degeneration goes hand in hand ending into cirrhosis of the liver this is of course end stage damage as we said in our definition so definition of cirrhosis is a chronic progressive disease of the liver characterized by extensive degeneration and destruction of the liver parenchymal cells and the liver cells attempt to regenerate but the regenerative process is disorganized resulting in abnormal blood vessels and bile duct architecture so the process of regeneration and degeneration continues hand in hand and the definition i have told you before this is the chronic irreversible process of regeneration and degeneration goes hand in hand resulting into increased disorganization and fibrosis of the liver so this is the cross sectional microscopic view of the liver these are the regenerative nodules which are unorganized in between the fibrotic bands they are basically colonies of the cells and the fibrotic tissues is in between the cells that are the blue lines so this is the microscopic view in larger photo these are the regenerative nodules these are the fibrotic band and this is the end stage uh, autopsy finding of the liver cirrhosis these are the fibrotic nodules i have mentioned in the this one okay so this is the healthy liver and a cirrhotic liver fibrotic tissue and collagen formulation result in a complicated process so there is a cascade of complicated process going on to the liver or which is hum ab discuss karenge initially they are beautifully organized interhepatic structures these are the stellate cells these are the hepatocyte lining the blue structure is sinusoids and this is the perisoinus space sinusoids open into the portal vein and hepatic artery or hepatic artery or portal veins end up into sinusoids both are the same things blood come 
goes into the sinuses and then it drain off into the central vein of the liver in the hepatocyte lining there are bilirubin or biliary channels or bile duct so the whole structure that is the portal vein hepatic artery bile duct is equal to the portal triad Normally, when the stellate cells are in the healthy liver, they store vitamin A. They are so-called quiescent. These are soft. No one is doing anything wrong. But when there is injury or inflammation or any kind of damage, they become active. And when they become active, they secrete tumor growth factor beta. and they start producing collagen so look at this picture when the hepatocytes are damaged by any way the collagen cells become active and they start secreting tgf beta and it produces collagen collagen increase 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 hoti jati hai slowly and gradually in the perisinusoidal space पेरिसाइनोसाइटल स्पेस में कोलिजन की कंसंट्रेशन ज्यादा होती जाती है तो इन द एंड ऑफ द डे साइनोसाइड्स की स्पेस इट स्टार्ट इट बिकम लिमिटिंग ये लिमिटिंग होनी शुरू हो जाती है सो यू सी हियर इज इंडेंटेशन इट इज कंप्रेस नॉर्मल स्टेट में जब फाइब्रस टिश्यू इंक्रीज होती है तो इट हेल्प्स इन वूड हीलिंग बट इफ द इंजरी इज कॉन्स्टेंट देन देर इज कॉन्टिन्यूइंग फाइब्रोसिस और द कॉन्टीन्यूस प्रोसेस ऑफ फाइब्रोसिस स्टार्ट्स सो हियर बिकम्स द कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ द फाइब्रोसिस व्हिच वी फेस वाइल लिवर अंडर गोज दिस प्रोसेस यहाँ पर मोर हेपेटोसाइट्स जो डैमेज होने शुरू हो जाते हैं मोर स्टेलर सेल्स आर बिकम एक्टिवेटेड देर इज मोर फाइब्रोसिस इन टू द पेरिसाइनोसाइटल स्पेस एंड देर इज मोर कंप्रेशन एंड हेंस द वेसल द प्रेशर इन द साइनोसाइटल स्पेस गेट राइज तो दिस इज द स्टार्ट ऑफ पोर्टल हाइपरटेंशन अब इस सारी पैथोफिजियोलॉजी जो हमने एक एक करके इस पिछली स्लाइड्स में पढ़ी उससे हमें पता चला कि पोर्टल हाइपरटेंशन कैसे पैदा होती है द पोर्टल हाइपरटेंशन इज एन इंक्रीज इन द ब्लड प्रेशर अराउंड द लिवर कॉल्ड द पोर्टल वीनस सिस्टम वेन्स कमिंग फ्रॉम द स्टमक इंटेस्टाइन प्लेन एंड पेंट्रियाज मर्ज इन टू द पोर्टल वेन विच टेन ब्रांचेज इन टू स्मॉलर वेसल्स एंड ट्रेवल थ्रू द लिवर दिस इज द पोर्टल वीनस सिस्टम होल ऑफ द small gut and much part of the stomach drain into the portal vein which goes into the liver so when the portal pressure rises the lining of the portal tract or the venous tract become leaky the the fluids coming out from the endothelial lining of the portal or sinuses so this fluid moves into the peritoneal cavity when this sufficiently amount present in the peritoneal cavity or when the normal fluid in the peritoneal cavity start rising this is the development of ascites so this is the hallmark of the ascites you can see the full flanks abdominal distension with full flank is the descriptive sentence to describe ascites abdominal distension akeli jo hai wo obesity mein bhi ho jati hai but when we see abdominal distension with full flank it means we are mentioning ascites
So this is a algorithm for the development of societies. Basically, development of societies have got many mechanisms. Uh, cirrhosis and liver dysfunction causes portal hypertension, which in turn increases splenic capillary pressure, which in turn increases the lymph formation and development of ascites. This is the one path. The other is portal hypertension increases production of vasodilators. There is splenic and arteriolar vasodilatation then is the central hypovolemia then is the arterial blood pressure decreases which activate many mechanisms such as beta adrenergic blocker increases such as activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system such as activation of the vasopressin and it decreases sodium and water excretion so they are more retained so there is plasma volume expansion and the ascites formation so ascites formation have got two mechanisms rather three mechanism one is the direct leak number two is by the production of increased lymph then is the intravascular volume depletion or central hypovolemia activating mechanisms of renin and angiotensin aldosterone system and increase plasma volume and then development of ascites so along with the complication we will discuss management of the complications on the same side for the treatment of ascites of course humne wo sare kaam karne hain jo ke opposite ho with the mechanism which was responsible for the production of ascites as there is salt and water retention so while treating we will do salt restriction then as there is hypoproteinemia in the liver as is the liver is the basic source of protein formation so we increase protein intake and as there is activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system so we use diuretics to counteract that system another complication of the cirrhosis is splenomegaly in large spleen it is fluid backed up so here is com complication of hypersplenism basically spleen is the hallmark of portal hypertension so what is hypersplenism hypersplenism is a condition in which the spleen become increasingly active and then rapidly remove the blood cells the hallmark of it is splenomegaly pancytopenia or a reduction of the number of one or more type of blood cells maturation arrest decrease red blood cell survival and decrease platelet survival basically spleen is an organ which remove unhealthy cells when it passes repeatedly through the narrow sinusoids of the spleen but when the spleen is in large cells have to travel long in the sinusoids so normal cells may become trapped and they are broken down the definition of hypersplenism is reduction of one or two cell lines most commonly it is the two cell lines which are decreased in the presence of enlarged spleen in the presence of normal bone marrow the bone marrow production is normal but due to the spleen the cell lines are decreased the size of the spleen it is not matter spleen may be just enlarged i mean minimally enlarged spleen can cause hypersplenism and sometimes massively enlarged spleen do not causes hypersplenism hypersplenism exams ka ek viva question is what is hypersplenism hypersplenism is decrease in the cell lines at least two in number due to the spleen in the presence of normal bone marrow
Clinical features is the mass in the hypochondrium. A mass in the hypochondrium ka jo clinically ya viva mein hamare paas se question poocha jata hai wo ye hota hai ki what is the difference between the enlarged spleen and enlarged left kidney. So there are the differences. Number one is notch is felt in the spleen while notch is not felt when the renal mass. Spleen is an intraperitoneal organ so it moves with respiration and the renal are the extraperitoneal or retroperitoneal so they do not move in the respiration. Spleen is dull on percussion while there are intestine or the peritoneal structures over the kidneys so they are not dull, they are resonant. Uh, spleen grows towards right like fossa while the kidneys grow towards midline. Hook sign. Hook sign means you can put your fingers inside the ribs while the, it is renal mass but you can put fingers when there is spleen. So this is the difference uh, clinical features as well as difference between the hypersplenism and uh, sorry uh, splenic mass and the left enlarged renal mass. So again towards the uh, formation of the complication so we have seen up till now uh, how the portal pressure rises uh, what is the mechanism of development of ascites and how it treated and the splenomegaly and one of the complication of splenomegaly is hypersplenism So whenever there is rise in the resistance while the blood flow through the liver by the increased pressure in the sinusoid, uh, sinusoidal space as we discussed previously, so it tends the formation of portosystemic shunts. Blood tries to bypass liver. So this is the development of portosystemic shunts. So blood directly goes from the portal veins to the systemic circulation without being purified or cleaned into the liver. So here are few spaces where the portosystemic shunts are more important clinically. This is the lower end of the esophagus and top of the stomach. These are the fundal varices and esophageal varices. The prevalence of these shunts to be opened is 35 to 80% while in 25 to 40% of the cases they do bleed and when they bleed 30 to 50 percent of the people die and 50 to 70 percent of the patient do survive but among these 70 percent of the patients re-bleed while we have done a therapeutic procedure which is endoscopic band ligation or injection sclerotherapy whatever the case may be. So in this video we will discuss about the management of the upper GI bleed. Management of the upper GI bleed may be while doing balloon tamponade of the varices by inserting a sang taken black moor tube initially or it may be band ligation or injection cyclotherapy therapy of the varices. The Blakemore tube may be passed either orally or nasally. Oral insertion is preferred, especially in patients who are tracheally intubated. Nasal insertion is analogous to nasogastric tube insertion. Be sure to apply a topical vasoconstrictor and anesthetic prior to tube insertion. Refer to the nasogastric intubation chapter for details on passage of an NG tube. Insert the tube to at least the 50 centimeter mark or to the maximum depth 
allowed by the length of the tube. Apply suction to the gastric aspiration port to empty the stomach, which will aid in the prevention of regurgitation. Okay. In the next video, I'm Dr. Joe Galati, and we're going to be talking about esophageal varices, a very common problem for those of us that deal with patients with chronic liver disease. Now, on this video clip, what you see going down the inside of the esophagus are these abnormal appearing veins. These are varices, and this is a result of cirrhosis and portal hypertension. And you can see at about 6 o'clock on the picture, at the bottom of the screen, there are these abnormal appearing veins that are a little darker than usual. And these are the esophageal varices that are at risk for bleeding. That is the big problem that we face with varices is the potential to bleed. Here's another video running at the top of the picture at about 12 o'clock, these somewhat bulging veins. Now what we're doing here is we're doing what's called esophageal band ligation of these varices. It's a small plastic device with seven or eight rubber bands attached at the end of the scope. And there's a small plastic chamber that you can see at the tip of the scope. And what we do is with suction through the endoscope, we're able to draw in the veins and with a twist of a dial, snap on a small blue rubber band. And what this rubber band does is cut off the circulation to these abnormal veins. And it does a very good job of reducing the risk of future bleeding. Keep in mind that patients that bleed from these esophageal varices run a number of risks, including infection, worsening of their liver disease, uh, and the potential for other more serious complications. Uh, the banding itself uh, only adds about an extra five minutes to the procedure. When the patients wake up from the procedure, they may have a little bit of chest discomfort, but this usually lasts only a few hours and can be relieved with Tylenol. I like to have my patients take some over-the-counter Maalox or Mylanta, or I may prescribe a medication called Sucralfate, which in my 20 years of doing this seems to reduce the um, complications afterwards. Again, everybody that has this procedure done is sedated. Uh, it's a rather comfortable procedure without too many uh, problems afterwards. Now, after the banding is done, as you're looking here, usually within one or two weeks, or maybe three weeks, we have the patient come back as an outpatient and repeat the procedure again to completely obliterate the varices. For more information, give us a call. Or So, this is, these are the procedures when a patient come with the upper GI bleed due to esophageal varices in the ER or medical emergency. So, portal systemic shunts, when they are open, so this is one more thing that they do renal vasoconstriction. Renal vasoconstriction is that kidneys may blood flow low. So, there is low filtration of course. And there is a end result which is called hepatorenal syndrome or hepatorenal failure. So, due to fibrosis, there is increased pressure, there is blood diversion, there is decreased liver function on the same time, and by the virtue of liver function which are decreased, there is decreased detoxification. So, toxins increases and they go up to the brain. And in brain, the most important toxin or the most famous toxin is ammonia, which is produced in the GI tract, usually metabolized into the liver. The GI tract produces NH3, which is called ammonia, and the liver by the hydroxylation converted into NH4 which is ammonium and the difference between the ammonia NH3 and ammonium NH4 is that the NH3 do cross blood brain barrier while NH4 cannot cross blood brain barrier so when the liver detoxification is hampered means NH3 cannot be converted into NH4 
So NH3 do enter into the brain. This is the development of hepatic encephalopathy, which is characterized clinically by estraxis, which are called flapping tremors. This is the video showing the flapping tremors. or which may terminate or result into deep unconsciousness or coma. So these are the stages of hepatic encephalopathy. You can see the display on the screen. There are four stages, stage one, two, three, and four. In stage one, this is the mild confusion, agitation, irritability, and sleep disturbances, and decreased attention. अब बाकी सारा खबर आप पढ़ लेंगे लेकिन इसको याद रखने का तरीका ये है कि स्लीप स्टेज वन इज जस्ट अ पर्सनैलिटी चेंज देर इज सम कन्फ्यूजन देर इज इरेटेबिलिटी स्लीप डिस्टर्बेंसेज और इन्वर्जन ऑफ द स्लीप पैटर्न दैट इज डे टाइम सॉम्बलेंस एंड नॉक्टर्नल अवेकनिंग एस्ट्रैक्सेज और फ्लैपिंग ट्रैमर्स मे और मे नॉट बी प्रेजेंट इन स्टेज टू The patient is drowsy, but is arousable by voice. There is inappropriate or agitative behavior. Flaps or estraxes are present. In stage three, depending upon the patient ability to obey the command, flaps may or may not be present. Patient is drowsy, but is arousable by shaking. or by motor stimulus as opposite to stage 2 which was arousable by verbal stimuli and stage 4 is coma so this is the uh, these are the um mechanism or maybe precipitating factors of hepatic encephalopathy starting from the hyperammonia hyponatremia gi bleeding anemia is these all are the precipitating factors of neuronal dysfunction or hepatic encaph so precipitating factors can be enlisted as constipation dehydration gi bleed infection excessive dietary proteins hypokalemia hypoglycemia hypothyroidism hypoxia metabolic alkalosis anemia azotemia medications hepatoma tips that is the trans jugular intrahepatic portosystemic stunt shunt or vascular occlusion these are the different precipitating factors for hepatic encaph management of hepatic encaph is management of the underlying exacerbating factors for hepatic encephalopathy so when liver function is decreased and we have seen there is detoxification there is increased estrogen metabolism as the estrogen is metabolized in the liver so there is of course estrogen excess so here are clinical features which are present in the cirrhotic patients due to estrogen excess these are the gynecomastia in the male that is the formation of the enlarged male breast tissue these are the spider angiomas or spider nevi this is the picture of uh, gynecomastia these are the spider angiomas central feeding arteries with spidery collaterals around then is the palmar erythema this is the palmar erythema in picture 
then there is also bilirubin conjugation is also decreased when the liver function decreases so there is increased in unconjugated bilirubin so there is production of chonus albumin production is also decreased when the liver is diseased so there is hypoalbuminemia clotting factor production is also decreased while some clotting factors are particularly formed into the liver so there is coagulation deficiency so there are early symptoms of liver cirrhosis or liver fibrosis when there is some fibrosis and most of the liver is functioning normally this is called compensated liver disease when the liver is able to perform its function on the baseline while the things are normal it means it still does its job it is asymptomatic or non specific complaints like weight loss weakness fatigue or oh, when the when there is extensive fibrosis then the condition is called decompensated when it cannot function even on the norm in the normal circumstances so there is production of jaundice or appearance of jaundice and to right of course then there is a cyclic hepatic encephalopathy seen which is characterized by the collision and easy bruising so these are the different phases of normal liver to cirrhotic liver to end stage liver with hepatic cellular carcinoma the cirrhosis is a risk factor for the development of hepatic cellular carcinoma the most dreadful complication of the liver cirrhosis here are the milan criteria for the hepatic cellular carcinoma treatment so if there is a single tumor less than 5 cm or 2 or 3 non exceeding to 3 cm or no vascular invasion or extra hepatic spread then the treatment can be possible by any means that are the tes trans arterial chemoembolization rfa radio frequency ablation or liver transplantation then there is another criteria ucsf criteria single tumor less than 6.5 cm or 2 or 3 lesions not exceeding 4.5 cm with total tumor diameter less than 8 cm and no vascular invasion and or extra hepatic spread so how will diagnose a liver is cirrhotic or not the gold standard is liver biopsy when we take a piece from the liver and examine this is the advancement in the field of diagnostics in replacement of liver biopsy which is of course is an invasive procedure we do transient elastography shear wave sonography is an alternative name it measures elasticity using sound waves stiffness is determined by multiple factors like degree of fibrosis degree of inflammation not good for acute hepatitis degree of steatosis not effective in morbidity morbid obese patient more than 3.5 cm is a skin thickness approved in us so this is non invasive comparable to liver biopsy this is how we score while in shear wave sonography number 2 are the lab findings like elevated bilirubin elevated enzymes which are aspartate amino transferase or ast alanine amino transferase or al ast is higher higher raised than a then are the gamma glutamyl transpeptidase gamma gt is a common name which are particularly raised in alcoholic cirrhosis then is the thrombocytopenia that are the low platelet count we 
group patients or we classify cirrhotic patients with the help of child pug torquot score this is on your screen so a is 5 to 6 b is 7 to 9 and c is more than 9 this is basically the survival score while the patient is having cirrhosis depending upon these parameters if the child pug grade a then the hepatic deaths per annum is 43 percent if the child b it is 72 percent and if the child c it is 85 percent so the treatment of the cirrhosis which is generally irreversible is prevent further damage treat underlying cause number one if there is alcohol stop it. if it is hep c or hep b treat it then is the liver transplantation which is the gold standard for the treatment of liver cirrhosis so cirrhosis is the inflammation and damage to liver which result in fibrosis and the causes are excessive alcohol prolonged viral attacks like hep b or c the symptoms are jaundice, a cycle, encephalopathy, easy bruising ability, and the diagnosis is biopsy or lab, and the treatment is un underlying, di underlying disease or liver transplant. This is the summary of the cirrhosis. So here is a scenario about the patient. He has got liver cirrhosis. And in next slide, we will see the explanation. This is the explanation. This is hepatopulmonary syndrome. This is the scenario of the patient with worsening abdominal distension. This is about the use of beta blocker in SBP. This is the scenario of the patient who presented with jaundice. The explanation is signs of hepatic encephalopathy point towards liver failure. 